My name is Harish Kumar Agarwal. I'm a program manager with the Desktop team at Microsoft. And I'm going to talk about the latest updates we have made to Windows Azure Desktop Services. I intend to focus a lot more on the demo parts, and hence my slide deck is way too small. Uh, in November, Scott Guthrie laid a beautiful Windows Azure roadmap and momentum uh, strategy as to how we have a set of infrastructure services on which lie a set of data services on which the rich set of enablement apps or as platform as a service of which Windows Azure Desktop Services plays a key component. Mm -hmm. And it specifically plays a key component in the one integration stack on Azure. Uh, when we think of Windows Azure Desktop Services, three personas come into mind, developer, business analyst, and IT admin, of which Guru talked about, so I'm not going to spend time on that. Uh, and as part of, as in November 2013, we did the general availability for Desktop Services, which had this bunch of key features. However, I'm not going to spend time on that too. <coughs> Two weeks back, uh, specifically, uh, more specifically, Feb 20th and 21st, we rolled out a set of updates, and they are like support for Edifact protocol, uh, integration with, better integration with more Azure components, service, <coughs> bun service bus being one among them. Uh, hybrid is not going to anywhere anytime soon, so we have simplified the on-premise connectivity piece, which is desktop adapter service. Um, taking backups of this, your desktop service tenant has become a lot more simpler. And finally, for IT ops persona, how do you make sure that, how do I see who took an action, when did the, when did the action happen, and what <coughs> was the action all about? So we'll jump right into demos. Um, for the purpose of this demo, I created this uh, Bistock service instance called Random Summit Vaps. Uh, <coughs> we go here. Um, we'll go to the management portal part of it. <coughs> the bunch of partners and agreements created here. So we'll start about talking with Edifact. So if you've already used Bistock services, you have see, you'll see the experiences for Edifact is in line with what was for AS2 and X12. Now if you go ahead and create an agreement, let's say Edifact agreement, and now you can choose between X12 and Edifact. Um, you can choose your partners, partner one, and say partner two. Uh, you can give your center of um, any factor identifiers. Uh, let's say it is mutually defined. <coughs> and again, the same, the, all the any factor identifiers supported by the fact standard would be listed here. Uh, you can track your mess the message processing along with the message body also. I'm using the basic edition of the stock services and hence I don't see the option to archive the messages. Let's say continue. Uh, on the receive side, again, you have a bunch of transport types. You can receive messages over FTP, SFTP, AS2. On the protocol part, this is where the Edifact largely plays, comes to the picture, wherein <coughs> you have the UNV settings, the 6.1, 6.2. You can choose to say whether you want to receive acknowledgments or not uh, on the interchange level or on the transaction set level. Uh, whether you want to route them directly to the partner as flat file, you can choose the <coughs> schema type, in this case, for example, D10B. Uh, also, if you notice, we support all the Edifact schemas up to year 2010. So that is the D10B, and invoice is one type of Edifact message type. So we made sure that Bistock server and services support the same set of schemas. And if you go to the advanced settings, you can do the more complex level settings such as uh, whether you want to allow message duplication, uh, duplicates or not, whether you want to do extens extended message validation, uh, whether the interchange should, should be split at the transaction set level or should it be preserved, and how should the suspension happen. And finally, the set of UNA character sets and separators. 
you can choose to transform the message once it has been broken up into XML. And finally, route it to one of the multiple endpoints we support. Um, there's a bridge, blob, service bus, and you can also choose to route it based on an Edifax setting. Say I want to route it based on a UNH or a UNG value. I can do that here. I can say equals and whatever value um, makes sense here. <coughs> uh, on the send side, again, the inbound part, uh, you can run a transformation on it. You can do batching on it, to, so to say. So trial batch. You can say, hey, I want to batch all my messages. And you can just, uh, you can set your release criteria. For example, it can be as simple as it happens daily, starting today, and it will be like 5 p.m. in the evening. And it happens every day, right? And I can save this. And again, on the outbound side, you can set your envelope settings, the UNB values. Again, expect, uh, set whether you expect acknowledgements or not. Uh, the schemas, you have all of these message types, the versions, and finally the schema choice. Uh, you can set your UNG envelope and a stamp uh, uh, the UNG segment on the outgoing message whether the message is a test indicator, uh, is a test message or a production message, character set separators, which are the UNA values, the control numbers, and finally the extended message validation, yes or no. And again, finally, uh, route it out on various uh, channels such as AS2, FTP, service bus, blobs, whatever. If you notice, uh, come back to protocol, we have divided this into two, Session, uh, two segments. One of the basic settings, which are the most common or the most used ones, and then the set of advanced settings uh, to say, if you, if only if you're interested in them, you can go ahead and set it. So as Guru mentioned, the idea is to make EDI a lot more simpler. So you, if, you, if you don't need this, just come here, choose your uh, acknowledgements, uh, your schemas, uh, set the UNB values, and you're good to go. Let's see this, how do we do this via the API level. So on the BizTalk services, BizTalk services exposes a set of trading partner management APIs using which you can create and manage your partners and agreements. So if you haven't used this before, I'll give a one minute dump of it. So you specify your credentials for the WAPs tenant you have created in this case, for me, it is LS Waps, the one I showed through the Azure portal. Um, and then you have a bunch of APIs exposed. This will create the two partners for me and create two profiles underneath, underneath it, then establish a partnership between them. And then I'm using the extra protocol settings and the Edifact protocol settings to create an extra agreement between the two and also an Edifact agreement between the two. So I'll skip extra for now. I'll show Edifact. So you set your agree agreement name, uh, you spec specify bis which business profiles are to be linked, uh, you specify which settings, you can uh, establish a batch, all via the API itself. Not only can you do this at the one-time creation time, once you have done a settings, deployed it, later in production, if there's a minor tweak to be made, you can go ahead, you just make the change and deploy it, and this will update the uh, agreement which is running in production. For the so creation, um, it, it should have created my extra agreement now, and now it will create the Edifact agreement for me. Um, let's quickly go to the BizTalk portal and see if they've actually done that. 367, okay, yeah, so it has created one extra and one Edifact agreement. Uh, so now if you go to the Edifact agreement, you'll see the name already being set, protocol set, the partners are already chosen, the identifiers are also set, and one can actually go ahead, set the transport types on what messages to be received and sent. 
and hit deploy. And this will actually bring the agreement into actual runtime effect. Uh, for the purposes of this demo, I've already created an agreement called Demo ID Fact Agreement. This is establishing a uh, partnership between Contraso and Fabricam. Contraso is a partner which is being represented by this dispatch services. And uh, it is supposed to receive messages from Fabricam and then send uh, ID Fact messages to Fabric Fabricam. Um, on the receive side, messages are coming over HTTP. The message type is a read and the invoice, and there are no acknowledgements set. There's no transformation uh, enabled here, but we'll come to that later. And on the route side, it is sending to a service bus queue. If it is successful, it is sending to an endpoint called success queue. queue. And if it is there's a failure, it is sending to a different queue, which is a suspend queue. And on the send side, when Contoso is sending to Fabricam, <coughs> uh, again, receiving messages over HTTP, no transformation, but here and I'm batching the incoming messages <coughs> to say batch all messages, uh, criteria is one, one is equal to one. You can uh, set up more complex criteria, so you can actually do a uh, and and an or. Okay. Let me close this, let me do an add new batch. <coughs> oh, okay, as my message type I can do, and then I can say, there can be multiple conditions here on which I do a join and then say, hey, this batch needs to be enabled. So in this particular one, all messages incoming are getting bashed. And it is being released when there are two messages uh, in the batching subsystem. And finally, this gets released as soon as the message count is two. Uh, on the outgoing side, the syntax version is three. We support up to four. No acknowledgments. The message type is again read and the invoice. And advanced settings are the default settings here. And messages are going over again to the same success queue. And if it, in case of suspension, it is going to the suspend queue. So we'll just quickly take a message and run through it. So on the receive side, I'm sending this edifact messages for those who are familiar with edifact. Uh, you'll see it is between Fabricam is sending to Contraso, and it is a D10B invoice. So this should likely get through. I'm using the message sender code, which is a public tool we have. Uh, what this is doing is, uh, message sender, this is my ACS credentials. This is the receive endpoint. This is a message, and the uh, encoding type is text slash plain. And I have just two listeners list. Um, uh, this can get slightly complicated in the sense that it, too, uh, too hard to understand that, but let me do this. Let me clear all of this out. So, uh, the left hand side is my success queue, right hand side is my suspend queue for easier identification. Uh, So this is suspend, and and now I'll hit the message send again. So my success queue should ideally be getting an XML, the same message converted to XML, which it is doing. Um, now let's do the send side in on which the batching is enabled. Um, so this time I am sending an XML message, which is a D10B invoice. Um, quite a lengthy message, but not still as complicated as real world EDI messages. Uh, uh, and this is of type XML. So the message is sent, you see the tracking ID here, but still I won't be receiving it at my success endpoint because it expects two messages. So just hit send again. 
and now I should be getting something here. So now I see a flat file, which is a edit fact message incoming. Uh, just for the, just to show a faulty case, I'm sending a D11 B invoice, which is not yet, not yet configured. So this should ideally fail. So this is my faulty message. And now my suspend side should be getting something. Yeah, so it says a bunch of, uh, some messages have suspended. And if you go to the tracking view now, let me just refresh it. So <coughs> it does say that, hey, B11B uh, invoice was not expected or it was not yet deployed, right? So coming to the tracking view, let me talk about that for a moment. If I've used X12, this is pretty much in line with that. Uh, I, in fact, have just been stitched into the same experience. There are no active batches right now, but a bunch of batches have been completed and released, the latest one being what we saw right now. So. This was uh, all about Edifact, how the support is available now. There are multiple queries uh, coming from customers and how can we take this Edifact and go live. So we are doing that engagement. And if you have a Bistock service solution as of today and you want to move to Bistock services, we have a tool called TPM Migration Tool, which actually helps you move all your settings from your Bistock server 2010 to Bistock services just by running that tool. Right. So, and as Guru mentioned earlier that, hey, <coughs> take for an example, multiple suppliers are talking to one retailer. Uh, you would want all the artifact message or EDI messages to come across, convert it into XML, and then have a, maybe have a persistence point. Say you're choosing service bus queues if the size limitation allows you. And now that you have messages in the queue, you need to pull it, do a canicalization on, on top of it, run a map maybe, and then send it to your on-premise LOB, which could be SAP, uh, Oracle or SQL. But however, as of today, if you have messages in the queue, you need to have Azure worker role pulling from those, pulling from the queue, then sending it to a bridge, which will do the transformation and then send it to on-premise. That story has been made a lot simpler with from S service bus coming into picture. So in the toolbox now, if you go in a so set of sources, you only had FTP and SFTP source previously. HTTP was implicit. And as part of the February updates, we have added pull from service bus source, uh, service <coughs> bus queue and service bus subscription. So, and you can connect this directly to a one-way bridge or pass-through bridge, so to say. And this will frequently pull the messages, pull from the queue, process it as per the configuration you have specified here, and then send it to the destination. The flow I've configured here looks deceptively simple but the, it is a, quite a big enabler on when you actually want to do some real world processing. And you don't need to have other, other, <coughs> other components like your worker role and actually bring in more tracking and more manageability angles from your end. So uh, this queue is the same queue to which uh, the Edifact agreement was sending messages to. Uh, maybe six seconds, <coughs> route, this is a success, success queue. And the same queue has been configured here, uh, here success queue. Uh, in the one-way bridge, uh, it is like expecting a Edifact invoice message in the form of XML. It is validating that message and finally doing a map on it. The map is way too simple. It is just taking a bunch of UNH values, uh, doing a concatenation on top of it and assigning it to a um, element on the right-hand side. And finally, uh, this that transformed message is actually being sent to my on-premise SQL, which is hosted on my local box here. So, okay, let's connect. Uh, let me just clear this out. So now I should have nothing. Okay. Uh, so we'll be sending messages again to the Edifact agreement. It will be an Edifact message 
uh, it will convert it into XML, drop it into the queue. The bridge will pull it from the queue, run a map on top of it, and then via service bus relay, send it to the on-premise desktop adapter service running on my box, and then post it to SQL. I'm hoping all of this works. Uh, let's start the polling from the queue. Sure. Starting the poll. So this says, okay, all sources have been started. I'll say, I'll send the same artifact message, text slash plain. So this is sent and it should be arriving, yes. So it arrives here. The SQL, and in the tracking view, uh, you see one EDI success route to say I have sent it to the uh, queue, and one route to say, hey, I pulled from the queue, and I've sent it to on-premise uh, the table. When you talk about hybrid connectivity, as we saw here, previously the Bustock adapter service required a SQL server connection to so store the configuration state of the Bustock adapter service. The improvement we have done is now the configuration of Bustock adapter service is stored in Bustock service system. You do not require a SQL connection. So for example, if you're talking to SAP, you do not require a SQL connection at all on premise. Uh, you just need a uh, Bustock <coughs> service uh, endpoint and that should be it. So now this endpoint is Though I am talking to SQL in this particular example and hence it requires SQL, but from a config, if you're talking to any other LOB, you don't require SQL anymore. Also, previously, as part of November updates, if you had to take backups of the Bistock services configuration, all the agreements, all the bridges, all the maps you have in Bistock services, you typically want to take backups so that you can replicate the environment as a dev or a test environment or a prod environment. Or in case the first one, first data center goes down, you need to bring it up. You need to bring up a new production instance. So taking up the backups required you to use the uh, RDFE API, uh, PowerShell API we exposed, and actually run it on a scheduled manner at your end. With the Feb updates, we have provided a new tab called Configure in the Auth portal, Azure portal. Uh, you can choose to say, hey, I need to take automatic back backups specify a storage account. In my case, I've chosen LS Vaps in West Bureau. Uh, specify the frequency, uh, the start time, and a retention policy of how many backups you want <coughs> to be persisted. And that's it. It will take, your, take up the backups automatically. You don't need to do anything else. In case you need to bring up a, the similar environment again, you just take the backup, run a restore command at your end, and that would just replicate the environment when, whenever you need it. Also from an IT ops persona, you want to know, hey, who took an operation on my Bistock services, what was the action, and where did it happen? So this is a common platform for all Azure services to push their operations, and this prov <coughs> uh, provides a unified view across that. So Bistock services has tied into this framework. You choose your service, say, from Feb 20th, since it happened, what are the operations taking place? And this will give you the list of all the items which I have done in this case, right from creating the service uh, to deleting it. Uh, I created the service, I deleted the service, and then every one day, uh, the, uh, the backup operation was happening. And in certain cases, I scaled out the service. In this particular case, because <coughs> it's a basic instance, you cannot scale it out. This one, basic, it will give you the date time and what was the operation like. Uh, gap in this one is, this specifies all the operations you have done by <coughs> Azure portal as of now. Not, if you, have, if you have done it by the API, this will not show up here. But that is the improvement we are working on and in the next updates, you'll actually see all of the management operations, all of the state change operations, showing up as part of this view. 
now that we have seen what's there as of today, what's coming next? Uh, as part of management, we have integration with ACS as of today. Uh, we're thinking about integration with Azure Active Directory, which is in the works. Uh, better integrated experience for entire BizTalk services. In some cases, you have PowerShell APIs. In some cases, you have the BizTalk portal to, de to do some actions. So we want to unify this into one single experience. Uh, on the EI front, uh, as Guru mentioned, the BizTalk adapter service, which is the on-premise hybrid connectivity piece, talks to only five LOBs. We know this is not enough, and we also know that, hey, we, to cater to this faster, we cannot do all the work. So our thinking is to actually expose the framework so that we can write a few, and the, this room and the BizTalk ecosystem can actually write more adapters to talk to more uh, endpoints like file adapter, uh, Exapta, CRM, anything you like. Uh, Derived tech support and transforms is in the works wherein if a Salesforce wants to talk to CRM, you need to have Derived tech support in mapping so that that communication can happen. Um, as you heard, JSON support is already coming in the server. This is about bringing the same into services land. Uh, BizTalk services as of today, on the outgoing side, can do hybrid connectivity. What if you want to pull messages from SAP and actually send it to BizTalk services? So we want to sub natively support pulling from LOBs and then posting messages to BizTalk services, which can do the processing and then sending, uh, send it out to wherever you see fit. On the B2B front, agreement decoupling this answers your question that, hey, as of today, one agreement always deploys two bridges. And so if I have 1,000 partners, 1,000 agreements, it will deploy 2,000 bridges as of today. As part of this improvement, you can have, say, 1,000 agreements with only two bridges. So this brings in a lot of manageability enhancements, and also the point he mentioned that, hey, you have multiple messages coming onto the same FTP, and it can get redirected to multiple agreements as per the need case. Uh, AS2 enhancements, uh, we support SHA-1 today. SHA-2 has been a long-standing long ask. And, uh, and also along with German certification. And finally, custom code in EDI. Hey, I, my partner does not conform to the standard. Instead of the value U, he sends X. I just want to do a find and replace. So custom code in EDI will help you do that. And finally, BPM, business process management. Um, you need long-running orchestrations in VAPs. Uh, you'll see that coming. You have ro rules engine. If the strict condition is met, I want a trigger to happen, and you should send me an email that, hey, uh, go and take a look, or my overall processing for the message a month has crossed $10,000. I want to report it to my CEO. You can do all of that. And a nice designer experience to tie all of this together. <coughs> so the experience we saw in Visual Studio is being updated, and you'll see the whole workflows and the receive side <coughs> processing, the send side processing coming into it into a, in a more enhanced manner. Uh, final disclosure, the stock services, quarterly cadence, <coughs> we'll be releasing it. We released the preview in June last year, the general availability in November, and the February updates uh, two weeks back. So we have been keeping our word, and hopefully this, uh, <coughs> this will continue. Business process management is coming shortly. As part of this, we probably intend to run a TAP program. So if you have a serious scenario in the next six to nine months, reach out to us and we can consider that. And extensibility is an opportunity for partners. You already see this in three form factors. One is the trading partner management or APIs, uh, the custom code in bridges, and also the custom code in maps in form of C-sharp scripting. And going forward, this will be available in the form of adapter APIs. Uh, and also uh, the workflows we are, which we are bringing in. So I see this as a big opportunity for partners to come and play a significant role in actually enhancing the ecosystem. Uh, that's about it. <coughs>